Hello, my name is Lynn Hunter, L-L-Y-N-H-U-N-T-E-R. I always spell my name at the beginning of one of these videos because I spell my first name with two L's. Hunter is spelled the normal way. I'm a storyboard artist um, for animation, and I'm also an illustrator. And uh, one of my favorite mediums for professional and uh, pleasure is watercolor. And today we are going to be painting the letter G for Gorilla. Um, this is part of my Apabet series and G is for Gorilla. And as you can see, um, I have uh, ingeniously contorted um, a young gorilla into the shape of a G. Um, I used to be the graphic artist for the Los Angeles Zoo many years ago as well. And one of the things that they used to give the gorillas as a treat was um, roses. They would bring in all kinds of wonderful roses. And the roses are high in sugar. If you ever want to try something amazing, throw rose petals in your salad. If you have roses in your garden um, and you have, you know, they're always wonderful in, in bouquets, of course. My, my grandmother especially, she was extremely proud of her roses, and she had tons of them in her garden. Um, but you can eat them, and they have a, a bit of a peppery flavor sometimes. Um, depends on the roses. Um, but they're actually quite sweet, and um, the gorillas used to absolutely love them, so they were a major treat. What we're doing here is I'm starting out with... A base layer, um, pretty wet actually here, of burnt sienna. It's one of my favorite colors to start out with. Um, Renaissance painters, when they painted in oils, a lot of oil painters still today will do their underpaintings in uh, burnt sienna to give that nice, wonderful red color that um, burnt sienna gives. And it's a um, earth tone. So the thing is, too, is that it's also got um, longevity as a paint goes. What I like about burnt sienna is that it both stains and has pigment in it. So when it's an underpainting, um, it'll lift up after it dries when you paint over the top of it. But it also will leave a slight stain. So it'll give a nice little warm tone to whatever you paint underneath it. And gorillas themselves are quite black. And part of the, the difficulty when you're painting an animal that's black is to, especially in watercolor, is to give it enough highlight um, and enough darkness so that it comes off reading as black. It will not go totally black. Just like when you're looking at the gorilla itself, it isn't really going to be um, totally black because totally black is like the absence of light. So it's more like a, a very dark charcoal gray, even than the darkest part. And this is um, an illustration, so you don't want any part of it not to be able to read. So you don't want any part of it to, to go to totally black. So the other thing is about gorillas, too, is that because they their skin has blood in it, um, they will be warmer sometimes in the areas where there's less fur and more hair. It all depends on the gorilla itself. The next time you're at the zoo, um, take a real good look at the, the gorillas in the enclosure. For the most part, they are black, but some of them will be um, russet. They'll be a little bit red in color. Um, or like with the silverbacks, and they're called silverbacks, the, the great big males. Um, as they get older, they will get graybacks. And so the, the bigger and bolder the male, a lot of the times he'll have a beautiful, beautiful uh, gray coat as well. But for the most part, gorillas are pretty black. And so I'm doing a, a bit of an underpainting of the red just to give him some warmth to his coat. Um, I did another painting earlier in the series with the chimpanzee. Chimpanzee kind of doing the same thing, except he was eating a banana rather than with this gorilla eating the roses. Now, as you can see, I've laid down the water pretty wet, or the, this first layer pretty wet. So you can see in areas like right here and here, you've got some um, 
extra puddling. Um, I'm going to just blot those out a touch with, um, I always have a paper towel in my left hand and that's for taking the water off my brush and doing what I'm doing right now, doing a little bit of blotting to take some of the, the water out. Now the, th the other thing you can do is it, you can have a, a blow dryer nearby or a hair dryer um, if your painting isn't drying fast enough for you. Um, I just have a tendency that watercolor dries pretty dang fast so I usually you know, kind of let it do, let it dry in its own time, and I, I, I'm able to see that. Like I said, this area is still a little wet. This area is still a little wet. This area right here is all dry. All this area in here is damp, but it's able to be painted on. I'm going to start in here because it's it's a bit dry there, and I'm coming in with Payne's Gray, and Payne's Gray is um it's a blue. It's it's a blue gray. It has um if you're gonna um, mix a Payne's Gray, I would take um, probably a little bit of Sienna and Ultramarine or um, Prussian Blue together. Probably Sienna and Prussian Blue, maybe with a hint of black in it to get a Payne's Gray. I like pre-mixed Payne's Grays. It's like you can mix your own if you like. I'm I don't have any problem with buying, uh, say, purples that are pre-mixed, and I will use Hooker's Green. Green is one of the colors when it comes to watercolor. I Personally, other people will use different kinds of greens. They'll mix their own. Um, I like to start with, a, you know, a base, a, a yellow green and a blue green, so I'll always have like a Hooker's or a permanent green light um, for my yellow green, and then I'll use Viridian. Um, for my blue green and you know add colors to that we there's going to be a little bit of green in here in the flowers um, it should probably be pre-mixed but as you can see I'm doing like light brush strokes to give a little bit of a simulation of fur because gorillas have on their on their outer arms um, towards the outside of the body they'll be more furred and towards the inside of the body, they'll have more skin. It's like their chest, stomach area, inside of arms, that area will be um, skin. And the outside of the body has the fur. Now the thing is, is what you don't know is off screen here, um, I ha do have reference material. I will Google. Um, I've got a, um, a number of photographs from Google in front of me of young gorillas. And um, I feel that you should always use reference material. Anybody who can do it without reference material, I give them um, great chops. It's like, congratulations, you can do it. Um, but for the most part, um, most people I know will use reference material of some sort. Um, I'm envious of all the people who were born many years after me now, ever since the computer has been in, developed in the respect that I used to have, um, have to cut up all old National Geographics. My mom had collected, you know, our family always subscribed to National Geographic and she had piles and piles and piles of them. And um, one day she was thinking about getting rid of, you know, they were just sitting in the closet and I said, Mom, are you planning to ever do anything with these? This was like high school or so. And she said, no, not really. I said, do you mind if I tear them up? And I did the horrid thing that only an artist can do. I literally spent hours and hours, because I can promise you, old National Geographics, they have staples in them, they have glue, they were never meant to be torn up, and boy, are they a pain. But that's how I would get my reference material for a lot of... Um, what I was drawing. I would, I still have two full file cabinets of what I spent my late high school years and early college years compiling what used to be notoriously known in the illustration profession as a morgue, because it was where magazines went to die. And you would use your morgue as reference. And I have files of 
all kinds of animals and I have files of ships and I have files of medieval cities and I have files of every sort of thing that I might ever use from magazines that not only that my parents collected but then um, there used to be uh, stores where you could go buy um, old magazines and I would you know and they'd be cheap I'd buy up old magazines, you know, if they were nature magazines, national wildlife, things of that nature. And um, a lot of times what I'd do too is that if it was a good article, I'd always staple the article all together so that it, um, not only were the, the pictures stayed together that way, but also um, um, I'd have the full article and the full information about what was going on with you know, if I, it was an article on gorillas or if it was an article on hyenas or something like that. Um, because initially when I started out in this field, I wanted to be possibly a wildlife illustrator um, or a children's book illustrator. And I didn't realize, well, I did realize, I realized how ridiculous that was in the respect that um, there are very few people who can make a full-on living in either of those professions and especially with children's illustration you do not make a lot of money there is not a lot of money to be had either in um, illustrating what are known as picture books or um, educational materials because what I started out um, and I was an art director for an educational um, materials company that did um, ditto master books for teachers a company called Frank Schaefer Publications. I was an art director for them and their magazines for a while and I broke away from that and was a freelance illustrator for, oh I did some work for Houghton Mifflin, I did some work for um, Creative Teaching Press, um, for a lot of small companies, for my former company Frank Schaefer Publications. I did some um, work for Ranger Rick and um, uh, Humpty Dumpty and a few um, small magazines of that nature. And I was able actually to make a, a living of it for about three or four years. And um, because of the tax situation, actually, I, I went from being a uh, um, freelance illustrator to um, I was going to the, the animators union in Los Angeles and taking life drawing classes to get myself out of the studio. Um, once a week and while I was going to classes um, I decided that I wanted to get into storyboarding and Glenn Vilpuma was my instructor he's a life drawing instructor there and um, I told him that I couldn't take his class one week because I wanted to get into to storyboarding and he said um, you want to get into storyboarding and I said yeah and he said you want to work for me and I ended up going to work on um, working with him on his storyboards um, on the television series Peter Pan and Pirates and that was the beginning of my working in animation and I've worked uh, in animation for close to 30 years actually over 30 years come to think of it now um, but that was how I got into that field but along the way um, um, before I got into working for Frank Schaefer Publications I was the, the uh, graphic artist for the Los Angeles Zoo from about 1983 to uh, 1985 and I got to be there when the pandas were there for the Olympics and um, did a lot of signage work, did a lot of educational work and um, it was a very fun job, really enjoyed doing it um, but again um, your career will take lots of different directions in your lifetime and uh, um, doing illustration for animals even though it was one of the things I wanted to do um, my life took a different direction so right now I'm doing these alphabets that um, are based on animals and like I said in the long way round basically letting you know how I use reference material and how I've acquired reference material at the present we're finishing up the Payne's gray here and you'll notice um, you continually get a little bit darker and a little bit darker and a little bit darker. Now Payne's Gray is pretty heavily pigmented. So I could, like, I'm laying down some heavy pigment 
in where the shadow areas will be. And what I plan on doing is letting that dry a little bit. And then I'm going to go in with a wet brush and scumble it a bit to get some more hair-like detail after it's dried a little bit. Okay. And that's more or less the underpainting part. Now I'm, now I'm going to try to start going back in with a little bit of... This is a little bit of lamp black. And what I'm probably going to do is lay this down and pull it up. Because no matter how hard you try, um, blacks always go down pretty dang heavy. You can see how heavy that's going down, right? Okay, so I'm laying that down. And then I'm going to take the paper towel and blot it back. Eh, that's too much. There. So I'm going to just use it, the make the, the, the burnt sienda that's underneath, letting it stain a little bit more. And then I'm putting the black into where the shadow is. And now, right now, the, the brush does not have as much water in it. And I can use it, you can see I'm using it like a sponge to pull out where I put a little bit too much pigment in. Okay, I'm going to do the same thing with the gorilla's face. I'm going to basically give it an overall wash with, it's got lamp black mixed into the water right now. It's pretty heavy in water and pretty light in pigment. Now, I are, I've already painted his eyes in burnt sienna, and I want to keep that burnt sienna in his eyes, so I'm basically being really careful to paint around those eyes. So I'm trying to keep that, that red in there. And then get the face more black. Now I'm going to go back in and pull out I'm basically I'm pulling out the water, pulling out the paint. Okay, this brush is full. Then I'm gonna take on my, my paper towel, wipe it off, go back in, and again I'm pulling out the paint with the brush, using the brush like it were a sponge. So wherever I feel that, that black's kind of too heavied up, I'm pulling it, pulling the water back. And you, get, you start to get a feeling of the push and pull of where your brush can go and how much pigment is actually in the paint you're using. And that really does come with um, practice. You'll, and the thing is, sometimes you'll lay down too much and you'll just pull it away. And sometimes it'll be too little and you go, okay, i got to load it up a little bit more. And then you'll overdo it, and then you can pull back again. And getting the just right balance between how much pigment and how much water is in the brush, it's a real feel thing, unfortunately. I wish I could say there's a more precise um, way to figure out how much paint to water is, is something that you can determine. It really is not a, you know, it, it's, it's oh, you're going to have to learn to feel for it. And that just comes with practice. And I wish I could say, oh, there's an easy way to do this. No, there's not an easy way to do this. Lots of paintings, just like lots of drawings, you know, draw over and over and over and over again. Practice, practice, practice. I'm, I'm always practicing. I have like four or five sketchbooks. I never, ever, ever stop drawing and I never stop practicing and the thing is is that I've you know my attitude is if you're you're a real artist you always feel like you're you're never quite there you always feel like you're never good enough it's never going to be you know the painting or your skill level is never going to reach the height of where you want it to be um perhaps the artists who do feel that way maybe they're the ones that uh are, are the ones that excel to the, the extreme top. But uh, with me, I've been doing this for a long time, and it, it, it feels like no matter how much I practice, I never quite get there. But I do feel like I get better. So the, the good news is you always feel like you're getting better, 
but you never quite feel like you get there. So it's kind of like the, um, the perpetual, you never quite get what you want out of life type of thing, but you'll get close. So you can see right now I'm blending a little bit more of, again, all I've been painting with is started with burnt sienna. The secondary color was Payne's gray. And now I'm using a thinned out lamp black. So it's like, here I am, you know, one of, one of the uh, standard things in, in uh, illustration and watercolor is you never use black. Um, well, if you never use black, why did they make black lamp and Mars black? And again, with those two colors, um, they both have their qualities. Um, I think that Mars is a little bit more pigmented than Lamp, and Lamp stains a little bit more. Um, they have their different control qualities, and again, that's something that, that uh, I would highly recommend you trying both. So it, it, it's like one has got more heavy pigment, one's um, got a dark quality to it, um, and it all depends on what you're painting as to what which color you'd like to use more. Um, like I said, I think they, they both have their their qualities that I like. Okay, now right now you can see I'm using to get the the hair strokes. It's definitely a light wet on dry. If you ever, when you want to get the detailed stuff, always light wet on your brush and onto dry watercolor. So dry paper underneath. That's where you'll get your highest amount of detail. If you want like really, really tight detail, that's where you'll get it. And that'll lay in nicely. So I'm giving him a little bit more fur. And the thing is, is that what I'll probably do too is I, um, once that dries, I might go back in and drop water on top of it, and that will actually take the the hard edges away and soften up. So, but so some of the the fur looking lines will stay, and some of them will disappear. We'll see what happens when I get done here, because um, a lot of times you'll you'll lay down that detail, and it's like it's too hard and too harsh. So sometimes you'll have to rework things that you thought, okay, I'm all done with this. Um, I took one painting once, one of the coolest things I've ever done, and I haven't done it in a while, um, but I painted one painting, and it just, it wasn't working right. It just, nothing about it was working right. And I took it over to the sink, and I literally put the entire watercolor under the sink, and washed off the color but the color didn't totally leave because again most of your watercolors will stain to some effect so it's like it got rid of all the harsh edges the everything about it looked better and what it did was it left me with a really nice underpainting so I went back and repainted it on top of that the other painting is an underpainting so here I'd spent hours and hours and hours doing this one painting that I just it just was not coming out right and so I just took, <laughs> I really, I mean, it, it took some courage to do, but I took that painting and I stuck it under the water and lo and behold, it gave me exactly what I wanted. And you can see, I told you I was going to go back with some water and here, when I put the detail on the fur in this area, I wasn't quite liking the way that was going. So I'm washing it out. And now it's giving me more, the spidering, I like the spidering up here and I like the way the light is working and it's pushing all this peat pigment to the edge. And that works better for me. <laughs> now, did I intentionally made do, mean to do that? Eh, I kind of knew it was going to do that, but not as nicely as it, as it did. A lot of times I actually find that the watercolor will work better for me than I expect it to. So... A lot of times, and then if it doesn't work out the way you want it to, nobody knows. <laughs> Only you know that, okay, that didn't quite work out the way I wanted it to. And 
You look like the genius in the end. I mean, yeah, I just was... It was the watercolor, not me. And that's, that's one of the things I will always say. Uh, I don't do the painting the watercolor does. It's kind of like I figured it out. Okay, a little bit. This overlap in his leg does not quite look right. So I'm going to take, get this lightened up. You'll notice the paint's gray again in that area. It's a heavy pigment paint. You add the water to it, and all of a sudden it does that nice, it pushes all the pigments going from the inside to the outside. So where it was too too dark for me right there, it's pushing the uh, the pigment more to the edges, which is more what I want. Also, it's giving me that extra blue. And you'll notice you can see the little bits of burnt sienna that are coming through and warming up the color from underneath. So even though the overall look of the gorilla is, again, he's more of a steel gray now. He's got a little bit of a warm brown. The lamp black gives you that warm brown, and then the uh, Payne's gray is giving me the blues. Now I've got the roses to do. Okay, I'm going to make the roses basically, excuse me, um, I've got some yellow over here that is not with my standard palette. Um, I think this is a cad yellow. Is it? I've got a Raphael cad yellow and I've got a um, Windsor Newton cad yellow. This is more of a cad orange. But anyways, I'm going to lay down a little bit of cad yellow and the roses. at the top. Okay. And then I'm going to come in with a little bit of a loser and crimson. And I'm going to start the loser and crimson from the bottom. And then the, the thing is, is that the two colors will start blending together. You can tell it's like, a, the thing about water is that it has got a cohesive tendencies. It pulls towards each other. So it's, if it's in the paper and the paper starts getting wet, then the paint starts pulling it towards each other. And that's what I wanted. I want the, these roses to kind of look a little bit red and orange at the same time. Now, I'm going to do, um, I've got some hooker's green that I'm going to start with for the leaves. It's your basic hooker's green. Like I said, I don't like, um, um, pre-mixing my greens. My greens always tend to come out wrong. One of these days I'll get... It's like probably most people look at it and what are you talking about? And it's like, um, it's just me. I love grass and I love trees and I love green is my favorite color. And natural green has reds in it and blues and all kinds of colors in every green. And man-made greens have a tendency to be uh, flat or they seem almost um, pre-made. They look pre-made as they are. They don't look like grass green. You know, grass green, as, as green turns into the shadow, it gains red. My, my favorite um, um, instructor, Jilla, Judy Krupp, once said, let's see. Um, my favorite, inst uh, she was my color instructor in school, Judy Krupp, famous color instructor in Los Angeles. And one of her favorite lines was, a color turns to compliment as it goes into shadow. I mean, that's poetical. A color goes to compliment turns as it turns into shadow. So it's like if you've got green, it's going to red as it goes into shadow. If you've got 
um, you know, blue, it's going to go orange, you know, they, they, any color you have as it goes to shadow, pull in some of your complement, the complementary color, whatever you're using. And you'll have um, a more satisfying color or more realistic color. Okay, so we got the greens in there. Now, my favorite, I love to use purple shadows. Purple and blue shadows are my favorite things. I love to add either a little bit of purple, a little bit of um, um, violet, or um, Prussian blue. I'll add Prussian blue too, or the, my two favorite colors to use for shadows. Just to, to add a little bit of color especially since this guy's in the, the black range. You know, when you mix the blue and the purple together too, you'll get the, the colors, the three colors mixing together. If you're throwing both the, the purples and the blues in at the same time, you get some very, very pretty colors in the shadows. And that'll just add some nice color to the piece in general. Now, when this is in print, if it were... Um, when I do send something like this to print, a lot of times you won't get all the subtleties that you're going to get in the painting. Um, you'll lose a lot of that. And I find um, a lot of my friends, they, they get a little bit picky when it comes to what things happen in print. If you are sending anything of yours to print, and I, I mean even off your own printer, um, you're never going to get exactly what you paint, ever. Um, if you keep trying for that, always remember what comes off the printer really is a lot of the times your final work. Um, this is going to my my uh, grandnephew Gunner. This is his alphabet, and I'm making all these paintings for him to keep, but I'm scanning them into the computer and saving the originals. For myself to either to use sometime in the future as a painting or I'm sorry sometime in the future as a book but um, at the present they're being used to show you how I paint and for him to have a book so he can have original art um, I think it's really important for kids to have real art quote unquote or art art that's like this that is done by real artists um, as well as books I send books to my my nieces and nephews and um, I like to send them musical instruments too I mean um, things like recorders and uh, kalimbas and things like that um, because I feel that art of any kind and expressing yourself in any way is is really really important so if if you're doing this and, and you don't feel that you're some kind of great artist or you're gonna not gonna leave a legacy um <laughs> who who knows what a legacy is going to be but what you're doing is you're having pleasure for yourself and if you give it away to others or you're making it for others you're giving them pleasure as well and I can't think of anything better in this world than, um, like I said, if I can make a ton of people smile in my lifetime, that's my goal. But that's it. There, there's our gorilla, G. Um, thank you for watching. My name is Lynn Hunter again, L-L-Y-N-H-U-N-T-E-R. You can find me on Patreon. Um, please uh, subscribe to my channel. Like the video if you enjoyed it. I will be creating one of these a week. You can find a lot of other um, watercolor demonstrations similar to this on my channel. And they all have stories. I don't just show you how to do watercolor. Every one of them comes with a bunch of stories as well. So thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. Hope you've enjoyed the painting.